Shout out to the CIA. What's going on? What's going on? What is going on, man? We got an important broadcast tonight. And we're going to get right into it. We're going to get right into this one. This is a, one of the few times I do a show before my show. But this is because I'm going to talk about a subject matter that... uh is needs a conversation with the family. Conversation with the family. So this is not an everybody conversation. This is a conversation I think needs to be had. And we're going to title this one, Image as Power, Birth of a Mindset. Birth of a Mindset. A lot, of been, a lot has been going on online this last weekend. Uh, especially with the brother Kwame Brown. Um, shout out to you, brother. Uh, a lot of stuff's been going on with that. And as a certified image master, certified image professional, somebody with extensive background in professional marketing and advertising, I think it's time for me to teach class. It's time for people black people in particular, black, black people in general, black men in particular, to understand the power of image. Image as power. I've spoken about it in many different ways, but I'm going to take you back to the beginning. Sit back, relax, fair use. Features a cynical and unglamorous depiction of the Civil War from the perspectives of a Northern family and a Southern family, but the second act of the film, which focuses on Reconstruction, is the real source of controversy. In Piedmont, South Carolina, newly freed slaves are shown celebrating instead of doing their jobs, living off government handouts, and joining all black militias to intimidate peaceful citizens for no real reason. Reconstruction is wholly painted as a disaster. The black vote is equated with white disenfranchisement, and a radical Republican congressman named Austin Stoneman is thrilled. After black men are elected to the House of Representatives, they're shown taking their shoes off, throwing things, and eating fried chicken before ruling that all white people must salute black soldiers on the street and legalizing interracial marriage as they cheer at the idea of marrying a white woman. One day, a former Confederate soldier named Ben Cameron, who is in agony over the ruination of his people, sees some kids being scared away from one of their friends underneath a tarp, and he gets an idea for the Ku Klux Klan, the organization that saved the South from the anarchy of black rule. After a small group of Klansmen attack a black barn burner, many more members join, and Stoneman is 
infuriated, vowing to crush the White South under the heel of the Black South before forcing his daughter Elsie, Ben Cameron's fiance, to break off her engagement to him. After a black man named Gus proposes to Elsie, she says no, and he chases her off a cliff. She is seriously injured, prompting an angry Ben Cameron and the Klan to execute Gus and leave him on the front steps of the half-black Lieutenant Governor Lynch. Lynch sends a black militia to search all the houses in Piedmont and kill anyone with Klan paraphernalia before Ben's father is taken. Elsie goes to Lynch to plead for his father's safety, but Lynch drunkenly proposes to make her the queen of his new black empire. Austin Stoneman does not approve of Lynch marrying her, but is tied up at gunpoint, forced to watch their wedding. Meanwhile, Ben and the clan win an epic battle against Lynch's militia to take back Piedmont before Ben storms in to save Elsie at the last minute. White people rejoice, while black people run home in fear, and during the next election they are physically intimidated by the clan into staying home, and the film ends with Margaret Cameron marrying Phil Stoneman, and Elsie Stoneman marrying Ben Cameron, followed by the title card, Dare we dream of a golden day when the bestial war shall rule no more, but instead the gentle prince in the hall of brotherly love in the city of peace, as Jesus Christ makes an appearance to preside over the wedding reception. Now. That, my friends, is the first part of the presentation. That was a movie entitled D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Many people, sadly, many black people, never watched this movie. And some of you have only heard of Birth of a Nation as the latest remake with Nate Parker. I need you guys to pay close attention because we're about to start understanding image as power. Image as power. You need to go back to a time before the com internet, computers, before the telephone, before the radio, where people got their information from either telegraph, newspaper, or their life. How many people have seen the Birth of a Nation movie. If you have, raise your hand. Because we need to get into the next part of it. The next part of it, what really, the part that really sticks. See, a lot of times we get asked, talked about racism and white supremacy and a lot of that stuff, I mean, that, that stuff has its place. But I need you for, I need everybody in here to understand how media can be used for whatever purposes deemed necessary. Hour long score that blended original pieces with existing works and new arrangements of old melodies, not to mention character themes and what's commonly known as the first theme song from a movie. There's the innovative storytelling that dramatized historical events alongside fiction and built the film's plot to an exciting climax. The whole thing is a technical marvel with a singular vision from its director, producer, editor, and screenwriter, D.W. Griffith. There was no second unit or assistant director Pay and attention. the entire film was shot without a script or written notes. Even though it was shot over four months, only one shot in the film took more than one take. Though the original budget was only around $40,000 or just under a million in today's money, Griffith spent over $110,000, or almost $2.5 million, over the entire production, and if the director's passion was that strong, and his vision for the film was so singular, it's worth looking at where they may come from. David Wart Griffith was born in 1875, just 10 years after the American Civil War, to Jacob Griffith, a former Confederate colonel just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. He grew up hearing his dad's imaginative war stories and receiving all of his education at home because his family was poor. He began his career as a playwright and an actor before directing his first film for a studio called Biograph in 1908. He must have liked directing because he continued to direct 48 more shorts that year and 400 over the next five years. All of these films were one reels, roughly 12 minutes long. It's often said that The Birth of a Nation is the first American full-length film, which is entirely false. It wasn't even Griffith's first full-length movie. However, The Birth of a Nation was the first American 12 reel film, making it a far more epic affair than other feature films which were averaging around 4-6 to six reels, but before he could produce such a big project, he left Biograph for a studio called Mutual Films that would allow him to make what would become Birth of a Nation. Fair use! It's worth noting that there were two major outside influences on the film, the first being New South Revisionism, a turn of the century. 
Now understand, this is the man who made the movie. And what did you hear? He was born 10 years after, uh, not long after the Civil War, 10 years after the Civil War, to a dilapidated country that was split between North and South. And this movie is going to have more to do with how black male images are portrayed today. And it's sad that many of you never even heard of it. Academic repainting of the Civil War as the War of Northern Aggression and Reconstruction as a Northern Angry Failure. It's common knowledge now that there's a lot that New South revisionism got wrong considering Reconstruction was not punitive and the North did not start the war, but it was an extremely popular idea. So popular, in fact, that Woodrow Wilson, sitting president and former historian and president of Princeton University, was a leading academic of revisionism and is even quoted as a scholarly source in the film defending the notions that the goal of Congress during Reconstruction was to put the white South below the black South and that the KKK was a force for good. One of your presidents was a fan of new revisionist history. Listen to what it said. Woodrow Wilson screened this movie at the White House. It was screened before Congress, before, before Senate, before the House of Representatives, and before Congress. And the president was mentioned in this movie. Oh, you guys have got to, you got to, we're going to school today. Pack a lunch. The other major influence was The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan, a 1905 novel by Thomas Dixon Jr. It rode the same revisionist wave and was specifically designed to tell Northerners to maintain racial segregation on behalf of the South. Despite being controversial, it was adapted into a play the same year as its release, and it drew record-breaking crowds in states like South Carolina and Virginia. The vast majority of people who heard about the Klansmen actually heard about the play, not the book. And while Griffith's adaptation was not entirely direct, it was just as inaccurate and grotesque as the source material. While the racism of the film is unquestionable, to ask, was D.W. Griffith a racist, would have to be answered as, yes, but... As his biographer Richard Schickel puts out, he was less of a staid racist and more of a careless thinker who fell hard for others' ideas. Pay attention. Was D.W. Griffith really a racist? Or much less a careless thinker who fell hard for others' ideas? And I want you to ask yourself, how many people today in media, modern media, um, are careless thinkers who follow hard for other people's ideas. Oh, you are. <laughs> Woo! He was rarely, if ever, politically vocal, but his films copied what he heard. He copied the Klansmen. He copied racist cartoons of the era. Because his films did not copy history. Copied what he heard. What he heard around the house. What he heard from his daddy. What he heard in cartoons. Oh, what he saw on a video, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Snapchat. Uh, remember how some people play slick and loose with how they talk about people and they don't know, they don't do their research. They just put it up on in a movie because it sounds good. Images power people. And you're looking at somebody who he was his. This is what we talk about, this great conspiracy. Often it doesn't start with a great conspiracy. It starts with just somebody who's careless, making an offhanded comment, taking something that sounds good because it may get clicks of views or stir controversy and not care about the outcome. He thought that he was presenting the simple facts of history. He took false ideas at face value and chose stories because of their potential to thrill audiences. In fact, just four years after Birth of a Nation, he directed Broken Blossoms, an interracial love story about a Chinese man and a white woman proving that Pretty much whatever ideology he put on screen was malleable to whatever he was reading or hearing about from others. But no matter his personal ideology, the film that he unveiled to the public had a massive impact. Again, he, this man wrote movies to get views. That's what his, his careless thinking. I'm just, just talking. But we're about to see how when one person can be reckless with the power of image, mixing it with widespread media, the damage one person can cause. 
See, we take defamation and lying and getting online and acting like you can say what you want to because it's free speech. It's no big deal. Huh, huh. Listen and learn. After receiving rave reviews at its Los Angeles premiere in February of 1915, The Klansman, not yet titled The Birth of a Nation, began a roadshow tour that brought the film to huge audiences nationwide, but not without making a lot of enemies. The most formidable adversary to the film was the NAACP, which was formed only six years before the film's release, but already claimed roughly 50 branches and 6,000 members nationwide. The Los Angeles branch was made aware of the film immediately after its premiere, and the organization as a whole disgusted by the film's lionizing of the KKK and misrepresentation of black men and women, slavery, and basic history were already taking firm action by the time the film reached New York in March. They protested outside of theaters, they mounted a public education campaign to expose the film's historical inaccuracies, and they called for censorship and bans on the film as well. Some screenings did censor some of the film's more extreme scenes, but almost no film review boards were willing to ban the film entirely. Outside of the NAACP... Why? They censored it a little bit. Some people printed retractions, but no. Most people just let it fly. Why? Because it put butts in the seats. It got views. This is why folks often talk about it. Talk about the truth. Why? The truth, when, when, when people, again, is it because the author, is the creator, wanted to sell stuff and he understood the market would buy it? They did it because the market's there. Oh, we're going on a lot of levels. See, oftentimes you hear in the black community talking about, you know, the, the, the roles that media companies play. But I say if we wouldn't do the roles, it doesn't matter what they say. And we stop consuming it. But where the appetite for consumption come along? Ha, ha, ha. Let's get the it. Prominent figures like Jane Addams and Booker T. Washington were publicly outspoken against the film. However, as it spread nationwide, riots would break out in and outside of theaters, but even though it drew extreme controversy, it drew even more extreme success. Exact records were never kept, but it's likely that it was the highest grossing film to date and retained that title until the release of Gone with the Wind in 1939. It played New York City for 44 weeks and ticket prices topped off around $2.20 or over $50 today. Critics were amazed and audiences were captivated. Anecdotally, in the scene where Gus chases Elsie off a cliff, one audience member was so moved that he took out his handgun and fired repeatedly at the screen in order to help her. The film was screened for all nine Supreme Court justices, many members of Congress, and it was the first movie to be screened at the White House, giving both Birth of a Nation and cinema as an art form a lot of legitimacy in the public eye. The quote, It is like history written with lightning, and my only regret is that it is all so terribly true, is often attributed to Woodrow Wilson, but it was more likely from Thomas Dixon Jr., the author of The Klansman, and an old friend of Wilson's who arranged the screening and loved the movie. You'd think that this level of success would thrill Griffith, but he was mainly caught up with his critics. Again, he thought he was presenting history in his work, so when people were publicly upset with him, he became an ardent opponent of censorship, going so far as to add a title card to the beginning of the film, asking for the same liberty that is conceded to the art of the written word, that art to which we owe the Bible and the works of Shakespeare. In fact, he was so upset by what he perceived as people being intolerant to him that he pooled most of the profits from the film into producing and releasing a film called Intolerance to Criticize Prejudice the following year. So this is a, you heard that right. He thought he was presenting history because he was a careless thinker and just presented stories, facts, rumor, innuendo. And then he was shocked when he got pushed back to where he became the victim. Didn't we see this play out just today? It was a box office failure, and while he continued to direct movies about the American Revolution and Abraham Lincoln, none of his other films ever reached the heights of Birth of a Nation. While it definitely boasts a lot of revolutionary technical innovations, its legacy has far deeper roots than just how movies are made. Todd Boyd, a professor at the USC School for Cinematic Arts, even submits that this film, the Pay foundation attention. of modern Hollywood, being based in extreme success despite complete disregard for racial politics and historical accuracy, is a key reason why cinematic representation of minorities and perspectives from which their stories are told in a film is still an issue today. This is why black male media is needed for black men by black men, because look, money talks. This is over 100 years old. 
Money talks. And if you want a different image, black man, you're going to have to fund it with your own money. Pay attention. However, there was a far darker, more immediate consequence of the film's release, the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1871, Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act to address the group's persistent violence by making hate crimes a federal offense. Even though Republicans lost a lot of their hold in the South because of Klan violence, the original KKK was dissolved in the 1870s until it was revived by William Joseph Simmons in Atlanta, Georgia, just months after the release of Birth of a Nation, and historians agree that the movie played no small part in that. In fact, the first time that the Klan ever burned a cross was in the movie. The real-life Klan is adopted because they like Griffith's imagery, and they went on to even use the film for Klan recruitment for decades. The Klan was gone. For 40 years, it was gone. And one person with a pen and a platform. However, when the Klan was reborn, its agenda reflected current anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, prohibitionist, and anti-Semitic fears in addition to the white supremacist agenda that it held in the 1800s. Membership skyrocketed into the 20s, rising to as high as 6 million in 1925, roughly... 6 million! From zero to six million people, 5% of the country. That's right, 5%. Do your homework. You'll see that the Klan was actually involved in all levels of government. People ran on a, on a Klan ticket in the progressive era. You wanted the image as power. 5% of the U.S. population the Klan was active in nearly every state and had millions of members, some of whom held prominent government and religious roles. The rebirth of the Klan that this film triggered would last for nearly 30 years, inciting horrific violence and promoting grotesque ideology throughout the country as a whole. With the amount of controversy over the historical accuracy of the film, it's worth taking a closer look at what the birth of a nation misrepresented. To his credit, Griffith's depiction of President Lincoln in the film's first act was fairly accurate. Fair use. Just as the movie suggests, he was never a warmonger. He had a fairly hands-off approach to Reconstruction, and his death was seen, especially by Southerners, as a great tragedy, in part because they knew his absence would give way to new and different political ideologies. In line with the revisionist wave, the film inaccurately suggests that the North was responsible for the war, and it's almost entirely built on the idea that Reconstruction was designed to be punitive against the South. However, the film's most fundamental problems are its depiction of African Americans and the Klan. In the film's first act, slavery isn't presented as- Here is where you start getting the first images that many members, many people in the country had of black people. Remember, you could be in this country and, li and live in places where you never interact with black people if you were outside of the South. But if this is the first nation, if this is the first motion picture, there's all these cinematic things going on and, and ran in so many houses. This is the first time the image of black men, black people in general, black men in particular, have been taken into someone's neighborhood. Violent or oppressive. Slaves are shown dancing and being friendly with their owners, and white people are even depicted as being helpers to newly freed slaves during Reconstruction before the Republican intervention. Later, the movie especially perpetuates the stereotype of black men being rapacious towards white women through characters like Gus and Lynch, even though the historical precedent was for higher levels of sexual violence committed by white men against black women. Not only that, but contrary to the film's depiction of powerful black men physically intimidating white citizens, the actual precedent for racial violence as a whole during Reconstruction was white people attacking black people. Black Americans actively took up the opportunities and responsibilities of citizenship, and while it is true that 700 black men were elected into public office during Reconstruction and 1,300 held government jobs, their civic duties were never mutually exclusive to those of white Americans, and scenes like the one in House of Representatives are lifted straight out of racist cartoons, not the actions of the real men and women who held those positions. Even st So this is what happens when people want to sit, sell a narrative about you. The truth was one thing. Black people were active citizens after Reconstruction. But look, they got us with our feet up on the house, feet up eating chicken. Shout out to Kwame Brown for sparking another part of this conversation. And I'm going to bring it all home, but I need you to understand that the way this was depicted over 100 years ago 
plays a large role in how your image as a man is seen today. But like everything with your godfather, right? Because I may not be going the direction you think I'm going. Well, this was not the age of flourishing for all black Americans. Many newly freed slaves lived in desperate rural poverty for decades, even after Reconstruction, standing in stark juxtaposition to the film's idea that they lived comfortably, predominantly off government handouts. Even though Congress passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to provide rights to black Americans, states were able to pass black codes to ensure a status quo of white supremacy by restricting civic opportunities, the right to own or carry weapons, and even sometimes the right to rent and lease land. One of the mm. main reasons why the film leans so heavily and offensively into inaccurate stereotypes about black people is because there are practically no black performers in the film. Because all the black characters are white actors in blackface, their performances are caricatures, white ideas black like male media or seemed like. Meanwhile, the film's presentation of the KKK is similarly flawed. The Klan wasn't formed as a retaliation against black men chasing white southerners' fiancés and burning their houses down, but as a means by which to restrict the growing freedoms of black Americans and to undermine Republican influence in the South however they could. Undoubtedly, this meant over 3,500 lynchings across the South, but it also meant killing Republican candidates and white carpetbaggers and destroying black churches and schools established by the Freedmen's Bureau. Mm. Not only is the reason for their existence misrepresented, but contrary to the film's depiction, there were a vigilante terrorist group that didn't engage in mass military action, but audiences seeing the Klan as such a powerful and honorable savior of their community was powerful enough to trigger the rebirth of the Klan itself. The Birth of a Nation did so much to revolutionize film. It gave way to new methods of filmmaking and structures of storytelling while expanding the scope of what could be put on the screen to new heights. However, it was a Trojan horse. What was widely accepted as a spectacle smuggled and perpetuated a disregard for historical accuracy and a belittlement of black Americans that would reap real-life consequences for decades to come. And now, more than a century after its Get release, the likes up. We're still grappling with these conversations about freedom of speech, racism, alternative facts, incidents of public protest, and how the media changes the way that we look at ourselves and at the people around us. How the media changes the way we look at ourselves and other people around us. How the media changes the thing. Why are we here today? Image is power. And today I want to bring it home as one of the few actual image consultants on YouTube as a black man and the destruction of the black male image. Now you've seen what's happened over this weekend with brother uh, Kwame Brown. And he talked about how you had men that share his reflection, openly destroying him at any get ridiculing, talking about him. That man wasn't bothering nobody. And for 20 years, he laid out his case. I'm not going to relitigate it because he has done a masterful job. But I want you to think about something. One of the first things that happens, just like in this whole birth of a nation thing, is they mischaracterize you in the media and they use little bits of truth mixed in with gross exaggerations. And in order to make it stick, you got to go along with it. What's one of the ways now? You can sit back and say, look at what them white people did. We don't need white people in this conversation right now because we do a good job of this ourselves. You got a black man that comes to you every day, mo Monday through Friday, in a suit. And look at what they've tried to do to me. Oh. Uh-oh. But then, am I alone? No. This is the history. This is one thing you have learned well. You have learned how to destroy a black man's image for your own negative reasons. One, jealousy. Two, scared. Three, envy. Four, you wish you had the position. Whatever the reason is, we're the only group of folks to do it to this level for what? We don't need D.W. Griffith. When you got people that look like you, that will do. First thing they do is try to either tell you you're, you're either crazy, violent, aggressive, 
Gus. Uh oh, he was crazy, sex crazed, and crazed, gonna snatch that woman. Well, that's how they did it for the longest, you know, cops and America's most wanted, and this and that, and pimps and hoes, and so forth. But then, then they isolate that person, telling them, you better beware of the boogeyman. Uh, but then what happens on the other side? Then if you actually have the nerve to carry yourself in a different way, you carry yourself in a way that's not, you know, street or country or whatever, however you want to frame it, then you got to be gay. Black men, are y'all, t- are y'all tired of either being either a, a thug or gay? Every time a black man raises, rises to any sense in this country, he is going to have to deal with the fact that somebody is going to say he's a closeted homosexual. Whether he puts a dress on or not, from, from Shamar Moore, think about it. You, you would probably do better to try to name me the men that they have not accused of being closeted gay. And it happened to Denzel Washington, too, if you don't believe it in the 80s. Yes, it did. So you either got to be a hyper masculine da 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 or you're gay. The demonization of the black male image that we do for ourselves. Brother Brown talked about LeVar Ball. Now LeVar Ball's crime was what? He has three sons that he calls his kings. And he has two, three boys in the NBA. If that man were non-black, he'd be on the cover of a box of Wheaties. Or if you're a black woman, he'd be on Mount Rushmore. But because he is who he is, what the media want to portray him is, every time he stood up for himself and didn't back down, he hates women. He hates women. He's a misandrist. He's crazy. Kwame, LeVar, Kanye, Kevin, the list goes on. And all of it is to get, well, who 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 are that who is that person to stand there? Why? We don't need outside folks when we're willing to do this to ourselves. For what reason? For what reason? See, that's one of the reasons I don't beef. Because I stay on code. There are plenty of people who talk mad shit about me. And I have never said a foul word about one of these people on my platform because I understand the power of image and the power of media. Now, I will tell you this. Most of the people who say something about me have never had a conversation with me. Person, person to person, damn sure, but they will do whatever. But what y'all need to understand is we're reaching a critical mass in this time to where this is not working anymore. This is not working anymore because unlike when D.W. Griffith came out, when Hollywood and the media and the and the movie, uh, the movie industry, it was much more controlled. It's decentralized. All you need is a smartphone and an internet connection. And now the rabbit has the gun. And people have an answer for what they say. And if you won't hold that, if you won't be that, if you won't act like the thing they're trying to say you are, it won't fit. Two years ago, I talked about an article. Let me go ahead and pull it up again. A BuzzFeed article where a young black man. Hold on. Young black man. Man. Dressed. But. Well, BuzzFeed. Mm-mm. Put that over here. Two years ago, I did this broadcast. You're a young black man. A black man wore different kinds of clothes and they see if people treated him differently. What's up, y'all? I'm Pedro. I'm 24, and like many black men, I'm extremely careful about what I choose to wear. Every day, we're dressing for survival. And basically, what it said is he did an experiment where I must perform the same activities in both weeks while dressing up, 
My shirt must be tucked in. I must wear a tie or a blazer. While dressed down, outfits I wear must be something I can comfortably sleep in. I will not expose my tattoos. I will not change my typical behaviors or act differently than I normally would. That's how he went around the first day. And this is what he said. My thoughts while I dressed up. I felt pretentious. This brother was dressed this way. And he said he felt, listen to what he said now. I felt pretentious, uncomfortable and embarrassed, especially in a blazer, especially in a blazer. That's a damn shame. That black men have our images dropped so much to where a man coming out of the house dressed like a man feels uncomfortable, embarrassed, pretentious. Because he, we no longer associate our image with anything other than something you can sleep in and roll out of your bed. That's on us. <clears throat> I softened my walk to mute the piercing click clack of my shoes. My belt had to constantly be adjusted on top of it and these pants were giving me a wedgie. In other words, them dress shoes, them hard shoes. You know, when I say pull up, get rid of the Jordans and, pu and pull up your pants and get rid of the Jordans. That's what this man is talking about. He felt uncomfortable dressing in the uniform of business. Why? What are his experiences? A woman who worked at 7-Eleven greeted me with a smile and instantly asked, what's this for? A, me a meeting or interview? Or for, but she normally says meeting, interview, or court. He said, it's for work, I said, as I grabbed my change for the bus. She raised her eyebrow and nodded her head. This was in the first 10 minutes of my day. I thought, damn, this is going to be an eventful few weeks. My bus pass didn't have enough money on it. But before I could even get the change I got from 7-Eleven, the driver said, come on, on, it's okay. That's pretty tight. I got to save my change. At lunch, I headed to BLD, an upscale spot for lunch. The service was cool. The service seated me in the front of the restaurant where I received my order ahead of two other guys that were before me. I walked over to Chase Bank. The security guard not only opened the door for me, but also gave me a heads up about signing a waiting list to be assisted by a teller. On my way out, I asked him where ATM was, and he chased me down to inform me about available parking, assuming I drove, but I walked. Pretty damn decent treatment, if I'm saying. But then he dressed this way where he felt more comfortable. I felt much more comfortable with my hoodie and sweats. I don't have to worry about the click clack of my dress shoes. Experience, I saw the same woman in 7-Eleven. She only asked me if I wanted a receipt. No smile, no conversation, just business. My bus pass, again, didn't have money on it, but the bus driver would not move until I put in my change. Mm. went to the same place for lunch as greeted by the same server this time they looked toward the back of the restaurant for a place to seat me he ended up seating me next to the cash register I received my food fairly fast and, I, and he asked me if I needed hot sauce <laughs> uh, I caught him looking at me through his peripheral during, during my meal at Chase, the same security guard only greeted me with a head nod. Nobody assisted me and walked in. After sitting there for several minutes, I remembered about the sign-in list. The teller who helped me last week was talking to a client. And while, while this teller who greeted me last week was walking a client out, and after passing me a couple of times, she finally approached me. What's the problem here? The problem is in our minds, in this young man's mind, dressing up, dressing like a man, makes you wrong. He was comfortable dressing like a boy. And I'm going to say it, it's a boy. I just took off joggers that I had on earlier today, but it's still not what men wear. Not taking care of business. But we have, we have been convinced to take our own image so lightly that we don't even value the way we walk out of the house. So don't be surprised when somebody who looks like you can play with your image. That's why you can have somebody call that man. Uh, don't don't judge him because this people's crazy. That's why we can do it, because we don't value each other's image. I told you I might not be going where you think I'm going with this image as power. And it is time out for it. My opinion, 
as black men, you need, we need to start calling out black men who play with the image of other black men. Calling them crazy. Calling them thugs. Calling them criminals when they don't have any of these records. Calling them betas. Calling them gay. All this other stuff. Tommy, Dr. Comp, Tommy Curry, man not. Are we not men? Just because the man may not walk like you, talk like you, groove like you, does he not deserve the same respect you demand for yourself? And if you think you got a problem with him, give him a damn phone call. Speak to a man before getting online talking about a man. Because that's what we have witnessed. People getting online trashing a man's image as if that was not a man. And we're so used to laughing at it. <laughs> if you laugh at it, you're complicit in the own. If you laugh at it, you're complicit in the destruction in, in your own image destruction. If you laugh at tearing down another man, don't be surprised when it comes your direction. And we're the only group that really runs to do that. That's why it's so easy to do it. I went back and watched a lot of stuff that uh, Brother Brown was talking about and Stephen A. Smith. And I'm sitting there like, Jesus Christ, where's this vitriol and stuff? And I got to admit, a lot of stuff he was saying was making sense, even whether or not you, whether you believe it or not. The point of the matter is, let me ask you folks a question. He said it the other day. We can all tell you about Ray Rice. We can all tell you about what, you know, what happened to Jay-Z on the elevator. But tell me the name of the Seattle player that damn near killed that woman and left her for dead. Why is it? Because we don't control our own media image. That's the thing I've been preaching for the longest. Black men need their own media for them by them. But until we have it, we need to do one thing, a black male code. We don't go to the internet talking shit about each other. That's off code. Even if you think you're right, you wrong. Sit your little hot, immature ass down until you can talk to that man face to face, man to man. Because calling somebody out on the Internet. Is a good way to end up destroying your brand in the future, because here's the thing why I don't beef. Because just like you were able to see all this bad footage be pulled up about what this person said about that person, you're responsible for what you put online. It's called D, digital footprint, the ABCDs of image, appearance, behavior, communication, digital footprint. You know the stuff I've always taught about, teach, taught about. I teach digital footprint. Once it's out there, it's out there. Every time you see a black man torn down, you don't need to see who are you seeing around them first. Shout out to David Carroll. Shout out to BGS Hipmore. Shout out to Sergeant Willie Pete. I never really watched much of your stuff for Chronicles of Judah, but I know who first got this stuff. Look, there's so many people who could be shouted out. How many times we got to shout everybody out before we sit back and say, you know what? Does it matter or does it matter that we get the message out? Or do we care about who gets credit for it? Why is that so important? Because we have a scarcity mentality because black male media has yet to exist for black men by black men. Well, here's a chance. Understand that image is power and everybody else seems to understand its power. When are black men going to decide to start going in their pockets and funding it for ourselves? Because I don't I don't think you guys get it. Why would anybody else want to, to build it for you if they benefit off of you being where you are? The chances are th the chances are there now if you can just stay out of each other's way. Shout out to Brother Tariq Nasheed. I'm going to say that too. And it's funny. I heard somebody went on this show and tried to ask him how he thought about me. And that brother said some of the things that I do, he likes. Appreciate you for staying on cold, man. And that man didn't say he liked everything I do. I'm quite sure there's a lot of stuff I'll say in it that he vehemently disagrees with. But, it, but instead, he just so decided to say, I like this, and the rest of it, none of your business. Now, what's funny is just last week, I was looking online because 
I remember talking about that Mink Slide song, and when I did the shout out to Minister Jeff Ballard the Mink Coats, I thought that shit was catchy. I was like, man, I would love to play this song. And I wanted to use the It's Time to lead into my uh, interview segment. See, it's real easy. If you don't have nothing to say, your mama, your grandmama told you a long time ago, say nothing. Novel concept. Because in order to build something, we don't have to like each other. Just leave each other alone. Work with people where you can work with people. And when you can't leave it alone. Because you can't complain about racism, white supremacy, D.W. Griffith's birth of a nation, institutionalized this, police that, such and so forth. When the only when the first person that comes after a, a black man looks like you. You can't even put this off on women. Black women will stay on code. How many times has the brother decided to be destroyed on the nerve of, I'm keeping it real? For who? What's the reality? You? Oh, you're, the, you, there's only one representation of what a black man should be, and that's you. So this person ain't what it should be. It should be you. Uh, why does everybody else work in a market where everybody can eat? That Highlander mentality. There can only be one. Why don't we just take the high ground and say, yeah. People have been asking me what I thought about the things that have been going on. And I'm and I'm sitting back and I'm saying it's about time. It's about time we start talking about how we depict ourselves in media. How we choose to show up in media. We can't. And while back in 1915, you can blame D.W. Griffith for putting actors in blackface. And you can blame them for saying this was what you thought black people were. You can't do that the same way now. We don't like our image. It's up to us to change it. So I'm going to do this. I'm not going to change the way I move. I'm not going to change the way I move. I've been saying it since day one. There's plenty enough room. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of room. And we do better instead of trying to decide who leads. There's not, who needs to lead when there's the, who needs to lead when the market ain't even created? Build your own. Joe Rogan don't complain about what somebody else is doing. He don't complain about what Philip DeFranco is doing. They don't, they don't worry themselves about what PewDiePie is doing or Mr. Beast or Dude Perfect. None of them. Image is powerful, people. Image, I mage, mage, wizard, however you want to slice it. It is powerful. How you show up, what you do, what you say, belies not just you. Like I was trying to tell, I've tried to say for the longest, there's an individual image, but there's also an ethnic image. And if we want better outcomes as men, we must improve our ethnic image as men. That comes from the way we carry ourselves, the way we, the way we appear, A, the way we behave, B, the way we communicate, the words that come out of our mouths, the way we type, the way we write. How many of you will sit down and write a comment in the comment section? misspellings, I mean, in intentionally misspelling words, no punctuation, and just leave it there. 
How about this? Write it on a note. How about you just hit spell check and grammar and let the system correct it because it's next to you, black man. Appear, behave, communicate. And if you don't know how, time to go back to school. I will say that it is a struggle oftentimes listen to the way we speak to one another. We can improve this. But it all comes down to this thing right here. The Internet is here to stay. And what we put online. Well, shout out to Maximus Decimus Meridius. What we do in life echoes an eternity. Once it's online, it will echo an eternity. Stop playing with your image. It's not a toy. It's not a game. Stop playing with other black men's image. It's not a toy. It's a game. And I will tell you this. When you choose to play with a man's image, you are choosing violence. Things are that's an, it's going around now. You're choosing to wake. You're waking up and choosing violence when you mess with somebody's image because you're dealing with their brand, their reputation. So don't get surprised when it comes back at you in ways that you could not anticipate. That's why I don't beef. I'm not playing with nobody's image. I'm not playing with anybody's brand. Too important. I'd rather leave it alone. Because as soon as time you decide to do that to somebody, you can't get upset when they come back at you. And are we not seeing that right now? Lots of lessons in the last week or so. What are we choosing to learn? So next time, talk to you later. Back on in 30.